Yeah, it's 198 mold choice, non-calc. So um, given that we haven't done school in pretty much like two weeks, so we're a little rusty. I'm a little rusty myself because my tech is not working as it usually is. Uh, also, I don't typically use this map for um, scribing because I don't have an external mouse. So it's going to be a little rough. And actually, Carolyn, I'm probably going to be writing on the board. So um, just do your best. I'll, I'll try to position it this way if that helps a little bit. But uh, my PC is not connected to the projector, and that's what I usually use. So um, this is not going to be the best experience for you on Zoom. I have to just be honest with you right now. But um, we'll do the best we can. Um, but anyway, I figured the best thing to do is just get right into it, just start doing some practice problems. Uh, I could give you guys a more rigid like AP review schedule. And actually, I'll probably maybe create something tomorrow, like sure on Thursday. Like, hey, here are some things you can do day, you know, if you want to do a little bit each day leading up to May 9th, the AP exam. We you know that's something we could do. Um, but for now, we're just gonna be kind of casual, just just kind of just do some practice problems, kind of get you guys thinking about calculus again. Um, and again, you have lots of materials. We're not gonna probably get to all the materials, and if you do it all, that's great. Probably won't, <laughs> but I figure more is better than less. So anyway, so this first problem, and, and by the way, the format of the 98 exam is much different than the format uh, now, because uh, now they give you an hour to do um, 30 questions. Um, here, this is 55 minutes for, I think, 27. It's not that much different, but the format is different on the, um, on the current test. So if you look at number one, Grasping for the x coordinate of the point of inflection on that graph. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to do a few problems with you guys, get you guys warmed up. Then I'll have you start doing some of your own. I'll walk around, see how it's going. Um, so hopefully you guys remember that you need to do the second derivative to find a point of inflection. Again, I'm. It can get you a relative extremes, right? Mins and maxes. But you're going to need to do the second derivative. So if you do it once, that should be pretty easy. You should get um, x squared plus 10x. Do it again. And, and I would say this is a gimme question. This is a pretty easy question. Hopefully it's easy. <laughs> you get 2x plus 10. After the second derivative, what do we do with that? You guys remember to find the point of inflection? Oh, yeah, you said. Um, yeah, I'm like just so beside myself, right? This is. You gotta be kidding me. Wait. We might have to go low tech. Okay, there we go. All right. No, because this this is a loose HDMI cable. It's yeah. I never use it. It's the first time I use HDMI all year. Um, yeah, so you set it equal to zero, right? And you want to see where um, where you see a sign change for the second. It's not just it's not necessarily where it equals zero. It's also you see a sign change. Of course, it's a linear function. It's going to change sign at negative five, and so the answer is D. It's not negative five. Oh, 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 I was looking at no. Oh, okay. I was like, well, did I forget something? <laughs> Have I been resting two weeks? All right. So yeah, so that's that's a pretty easy one. So points of inflection, just to jog your memory, is where the second root changes sign. That's all. My guess is um, they'll probably give some a little more challenging, maybe something that has like um, some quadratic or maybe something that doesn't change sign for one of the x-intercepts. Like for example, what if you had just being hypothetical, uh, what if your second derivative was like um, I'm just going to write in a fact. Uh, yeah, I'm going to write in factor form. What if that was your second derivative? Okay. If that was your second derivative, what would make that zero? Zero. And two. two. However, will we see a sign change at two? No, because it's squared. Exactly. So you have to be mindful about that. So you could see, like, and this is the college board, right? So they might put both zero and two as the possible choices, just to mess with you a little bit. But of course, it's just zero, not two. Um, so just be mindful about that. Okay, next one's a good one. 
This is going to second semester stuff. Um, they're asking for the value of that integral and as a piecewise function, they want from negative one to four. So how would I go about finding this, um, that integral? What do I need to do? Good, good, totally. And you could chop it up however you want. Um, it's kind of up to you. You could actually um, make a right triangle here, another right triangle, another right triangle, and then a square, or you could do trapezoids, it's up to you. But you could break them into five small shapes and find the area of each of them. Area of should be pretty straightforward. That's one, that's one, that's two, that's negative one, and that's negative 0.5. Remember, anything below the x-axis is negative, unless if you're going from right to left. We're not going from right to left, we're going from left to right, because we're going from negative one to four. But again, the cause board could mess with you and do something more and more challenging, right? They could reverse the limits of integration, so you're going from right to left. So then anything below the x-axis is a double negative. But this should be pretty straightforward. What's, what's gonna be the area of all this when I add all up? Two and a half, good. So like these are like, and here's the other thing too about test strategy, right? As you guys know, some of you guys done SATs, ACTs already. Um, I think the juniors probably got at least one or two under belts because now it's easy. Last year was a mess, obviously. Um, some people had to fly to Idaho or Arizona to do the test. But um, if you think about test strategy, right? Some of the questions are gonna go by pretty fast. Like I say the first two, you gotta get like that. Like if you get in 10, 15 seconds, good. Cause some might take three or four minutes. That might be a possibility. One thing I probably will do, um, I might assign some stuff on Albert IO, just that, that's the website we use for um, AP review stuff. And actually um, I get some really interesting data cause I'll, I'll, maybe I'll say, hey, here's a little assessment you can do. And also tells me how long you spend on each question. <laughs> so, so that way I can kind of see, okay, like what are some questions that are taking a few a little longer? I say those first two are gonna be pretty fast. Some might take a little longer. Let's actually jump to what I think might be a tougher problem. Um, I say number four, it's gonna be a little tougher because it's not um, computational, it's more theoretical. So you are gonna have to know your, um, your theorems. So one of the documents that says, uh, know this stuff down cold and- um, So can I see the table of contents? No. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the yellow one that's a, that I use cardstock for, <laughs> it's no cold. It has the theorems and here it is, Caroline, just, you know. Um, yeah, so like that might be a good thing to have as reference as you do in practice, if you forget some theorems. Because if you look at what's being asked here, they're being asked here, if you're continuous and differentiable. Now for EVT, you only need continuity for extreme value theorem, just so you know. But you do need differentiability for mean value theorem. Um, so probably that's what we're gonna be talking about here. Um, now, first off, you don't need to be differentiable for an integral to exist. I'm gonna get rid of that one right away. You don't need to be um, differentiable because for example, what if f of x was like a piecewise function? Actually, just like the last example we just did, right? Let's say this is f of x here, it's a piecewise function. Do you have a bunch of sharp corners? Mm -hmm. Right, and we're not differentiable at those corners. So you don't need, um, so which of the following could be false? I don't see that being false. Um, so I would get rid of that one. Um, which one could be false? Let's see here. Uh, your your R guarantee mins and maxes. So that's always gonna be true. That'll always be true. Um, Hold on, let me think about this one here. Yeah, actually, um, I think that could be false. You don't have to have a zero derivative. Yeah, this, this will always be true. So this right here is MVT, just so you know, in case you guys forgot. That first statement is mean value theorem. Uh, remember what mean value theorem states is that if you have a funky curve or really any curve, that's nice and smooth. Let's say that's A and that's B. I'm actually really surprised I'm doing pretty well with the mouse here. Um, that right there is gonna be the slope of that light blue line. 
And then f prime of c just means that there's gonna be some c value in between a and b that has the same slope, which is true. If you're differentiable, so there's no way that's ever gonna be false. That's always gonna be true. But if you look at part b, will the derivative equal zero? You're not guaranteed that. What if you just, what if this is a? What if this was b? What if you had like a, a line like this? Am I continuous from a to b? Am I differential from A to B? Non-inclusive of A and B, yes. Is the derivative going to be zero in between A and B? No. So that's why that could be false. Something like that is going to take you a while to think through. You're going to need a little more time. That's why like one and two that are computational. I actually personally would uh, be somewhat judicious. I would go through this test and I'd do the ones that are more computational and skip maybe these and come back to them later. Because this is going to take a little longer to think through. Uh, it's a little more theoretical, right? Uh, C and D, just so you know, are part of extreme value theorem. And you know you're guaranteed extreme values. You know, and they don't have to happen at critical points. It can happen at endpoints, too. Um, and again, this was MVT. And then this one here, just, yeah, you don't have to be. I mean, of course, you're going to find the area. It's not a big deal. So, so that's the story of that one. Okay. We're gonna jump around a bit more. Um, let's look at six. That's a good one from last semester. You guys remember the technique here? What do we do here? Isolate for X? No. No. <laughs> Sorry, I've been talking to my kids a lot the last 10 days, so I... <laughs> Thanks, so, Ellie. Implicit differentiation. Okay, here's what you do. This is why we review. So you take derivative x squared to 2x plus, then you got to do a product rule here. Product. This is where I'm probably going to struggle with the mouse on the Mac. Product rule. So you got to take derivative of x, which is one times y, plus x times y prime equals zero. Equals zero. And you got to isolate y prime. So you arrive at the isolating part. You have you're, you're you're right when you said that. What you have to do is you got to do a derivative first with respect to x. And because you have a y involved, you, it doesn't just go away. The derivative of y is one, but it's one times y prime or dy over dx. Same thing. Now you got to isolate y prime. So x, actually, let me take it back. You don't have to isolate y prime if you don't want to. Because what's the question asking for? It's asking for the numerical value of y prime. Plug in two for x, sure. Yeah, how do you, how do you plug in for y? How do you do that? Exactly, yes. Whoa. Yeah, how do you get y? You got to plug back into the original. <laughs> and that, you know, a little bit of algebra, right? That's four plus, um, it's actually probably better I'm going slower with this mouse because you guys can process. I'm going to have to get, because I'm really fast with the other one. So 2y equals 10. So what's y going to be? Three. Good. So y is three. Now solve for y prime. If you solve for y prime, you should get negative seven halves. You, you got one for y prime? Yeah. Okay, did you plug in three for y? Oh, it's two y prime, not three y prime. Yeah, exactly. Hey, are you sure? Okay. Yes. Yes, yeah, so y prime equals negative seven halves. So, okay. Four plus three is seven. <laughs> okay, so we're cool with that one. 
good review of implicit differentiation. Yeah. yeah, and Ellie didn't miss much. I have some tech issues, so you're, you're good. Okay, um, cool. Let's look at seven. I know I'm skipping around a little bit. I'm actually, the problems I'm skipping, I have you do in just a little bit as practice in class. Uh, now, what do you guys think about seven? What do you think we should do? Well, we're going to anti-drive, but, but um, how am I going to go about the anti-derivative? The, the course was for derivatives. Yeah. I, so you could do a U, you could try doing a U sub, but I would not. What I would do is this. Whenever you have a monomial, I mean one term in the denominator, whenever you have one term in the denominator, you can actually reduce this fraction. You can rewrite the fraction like this. This is um, where the college board is really testing your, um, what's the right word to use? Your efficiency. So they deliver the design problems to see, okay, are you efficient with your work? That's why it's timed. It sucks it's time, but that's why, because you get rewarded when you're more efficient because you get to more problems. You get to more problems, you get more correct, you get a better score, right? So that's what I would do. Because when you reduce it, you get X minus one over X. Now that's pretty easy to integrate, right? What's the, what's the antiderivative of X? One minus X squared. Yeah, and I'm getting a little lazy. I do need to write the DX part. Are these multiple points right there? No, it's just for you guys so you know what I'm doing. Yeah, no, um, I, I, like, what, what, yeah, when, when I, when I, yeah, when I do this myself, I don't show all the notations because I want to get it quick, get, it right, get the answers quickly. So you get X squared over two. And what's the, what's the antiderivative negative one over X? Good, LN, good, you guys remember. And then you got to plug in one in E. You plug in E, you get E squared over two. And what's the natural log of E? Good. So you guys remember, awesome. You guys didn't forget stuff for a break. Minus, plug in one, you get one half. And what's natural log of one? Zero, very good. So then you gotta clean it up a little bit. So uh, now if this is free response, I would leave your answer like that. I would not do any more. But since this is multiple choice, you do have to clean it up a little bit. You know you're gonna have E squared over two. And you know you're gonna have a minus one and a minus half. So the answer is going to be E. Because you got um, E squared over two, minus one, minus one half. And of course, minus plus zero, whatever. Don't worry about it. So you get E. OK, perfect. All right. It, choice E? Yeah, negative three halves. Got it. Okay. I know, 30 second delay. Sorry. <laughs> okay. Well, go and try number three on your own. We'll go back and look at number three. Number three should be one of those gimmies. And by the way, make that X a negative two power. Okay, do that first. Do your anti dread tone check. That doesn't matter here. Oh, 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 sorry. Oh, sorry. I've seen something else. Um, yeah, no, you want to um, put the top in first and the bottom second. Yes. Be careful, there's a lot of negatives. 
Okay, I think I got an answer. We'll take a poll. What do you guys think? Anyone on the bridge? Just blur it out. B? I didn't get B. But I mean, I could be wrong. I don't know. I maybe I made a mistake. Let's see. Remember, you got to add one to the exponents. Hopefully, you guys remember add one to the exponent and divide by a new exponent. I get C, guys. Wait, but if you subtract one, I could be wrong. Hold on. Okay. All right, I'm gonna do this on the board. Okay, you have x and negative one or negative one. Hopefully, we're okay with that. Yes, no. No, we're not okay. No. Okay, so add one. What's negative two plus one? Yeah. And then divide by negative one. I got confused because I subtracted. And then you plug in two and one, right? Okay. So that's gonna be negative one over x. One and two, negative one half minus negative one over one. Yeah, that's totally C. That's C, one half. How do you guys do 724? No, because we subtracted. We subtracted X on it. Uh, we, got, we subtracted what? So it was X. It was X. Oh, X and negative three. Oh, got it, got it, got it. Okay, this is why I review. Okay. Exactly. Okay, all right. Yeah, you gotta add one. That's a trap. Okay. So this is the college board gang sneak on you guys. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sure. So the answer is C for that one. No. Okay. Let's move on to the next page. Um, why don't you guys try five really fast and then we'll do eight. Yeah, antiderivative sign is negative cosine. Top minus bottom. There are a lot of negatives again, so please be careful. How much like percent of the time you have to get right to get each of the scores on the eight? About seventy five percent to get a five. Seventy five percent. About sixty for a four, about fifty to get a three. Okay, so what did you guys get for five? E? E. Yeah, it's going to be E. It's E. Here, here's the reason why. What's the anti of sign? Okay, negative cosine T. It's a T for now. Then you can plug in zero and X, right? We're always plugging the top first, so it's negative cos X. And there are a lot of negatives. Be really, really careful here. Minus negative cosine zero. Now, what's cosine zero? Good. And what's a minus a negative? Plus. A plus. Oh, okay. So negative cosine x plus one, which is the same thing as one minus cosine x, which is why it is e. Okay. okay. All right. Now let's look at eight. Okay, eight. Eight's interesting. It's actually a very interesting question. There's no computation, really. You, you just, just, just got to know the calculus. I have no idea. I don't get it. Like, I think that's where we'll find out. What do you think? I said, see. Yeah, see. Here's the reason why. It's a constant. How do I know that FX is a constant? Because 
h of x is this, right? If you do the derivative of, of two functions, you guys do a product rule, right? But when they did the derivative, how come they didn't do the other part? Because that times x doesn't even exist. But it goes away. So here's the deal. What if f of x, what if h of x were this? What if h of x were two? Actually, I'm gonna say it's one, because that, that is the answer. <laughs> so h of x is this. So then what's gonna be the derivative of, of h prime? Well, what's h prime gonna be? Just g prime of x, right? And is, is it still being multiplied by one? Yeah. So that's why you don't, because if, if f of x were not a constant, then you'd have to see this. Then this had to have been true. They didn't show that, right? Also, they tell you that f of zero is what? Right? So, yeah, it's got to be a constant. That's why it's, it's kind of a trick question. Um, yeah. So, T. Sometimes what you need to do is look at the choices. Um, this is a question where it's okay if you miss it. I mean, you can miss 25% of the questions, still get a five. So, it's okay if you miss a question, but th this is one of the, I think, tougher, tougher ones. We have to think a little outside the box. That's what I'm saying. Anything that's more mechanical, like 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 five or seven or six, do those first. Um, ooh, this is a good one. I like nine. That's a really good one. All right, this is FTC. Just so you know. All right, they give you a rate. The rate of oil being poured into something or pumped out, I don't know, um, whatever. It's, it's a rate and they give you time for us. So you wanna approximate the number of barrels that are passed throughout the day. Um, so basically for the 24 hour time frame. Um, it's not quite FTC, uh, a little bit, I, I suppose, because you are, because you're thinking of this as a derivative. Because it is a rate. And we're f of x. Let's say f of x is the total number of barrels. So basically, if you go from zero to twenty-four of f prime of x, what happens if you take the antiderivative of a derivative? Just f of x, exactly. And your limits are from zero to twenty-four. It's a whole day, twenty-four hours. So it's f of 24 minus f of zero. But really, you don't need to compute that. You just find the area. That's really what you need to do. Just, just find the area. Like, for example, what, how much oil is piped out for the first six hours? Yeah. Because you're doing, you're doing it constantly for 600 uh, barrels per hour for six hours. Actually, what I would do personally, make this more efficient. I just do one. Yeah, I, I, I'd do one big rectangle and a triangle, and that'll be good enough. That'll be good enough. That's 2,400. So at least I know it's um, not A, B, or C, because it's going to be more than 2,400. In this triangle here, the base is 12 and the height is 100. Half times base times height, that's 600. The answer is D, 3000. So you have to recognize that it is an FTC type situation. And um, yeah, you're doing the integral. Yep. These are very common problems. Yeah, it's close enough. I'm just trying to explain to you that um, f of x, if I let f of x represents the total number of barrels, because this is a rate. So that's what I'm doing the antiderivative. That's why I'm doing the integral, because I'm antiderivative the rate to get the total. That's part of FTC. I'm just trying to get into a little bit of theory with you guys here, too. All right. Um, Hmm. 
11 is going to be a little tricky, but let's see how you guys do. I, I, th I think you guys need to try some tricky ones on your own. But 10 is pretty straightforward. 10 should be very, very straightforward. 12 should be fairly straightforward. Um, but 11 is going to be tricky. Go and try those next three. And we'll check in about six minutes at 920. And by the way, you're going to have to use a quotient rule for number 10. Or you could do a product rule. If you turn X minus one into a product, raise to negative one, then you have to do a chain rule with that. Kids, guys, Chris, I'm already done. Sure. That's why I do so fast. Yeah. <laughs> so I got to my own horn. I'll try to do it so quickly once everyone's done. Pretty much. Well, it's conceptual too for both 11 and 12. Oh anyway. <laughs> 10, you have to be a little careful. That took me a little longer. So, um, you guys, forget. No worries. Where we do, um, if you have F over G. And say it's really change. Wow, we got a dozen teachers out today. There's like over 100 students out today, also. What? Uh, just ninety. Yeah, we just uh, just just went up to hundred. We have one hundred one students out there. <laughs> like right before spring break, we only have like maybe three or four people on the COVID list. <laughs> That's not counting like all the people who had it over break. Yeah. Yeah, because I'm not. I'm not injured. Yeah, me either. I was there last year. I don't think I was ever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Eleven. How do you get the perfection? Oh, Anyone get answer for ten yet? Yeah. What are you guys saying? D. I agree, D. Good. I don't, I don't okay, so keep trying. No, no rush. In about 90 more seconds, I'll, I'll tell you the other answers. Oh, I got it. I'll give you a little hint for 11. So you're doing the antiderivative of f double prime. So it becomes f prime b minus f prime a. Just a second. 
Now, here's the thing. A linear function will, will be like mx plus b, right? So the first derivative will just be m, right? Regardless of whatever x is, it's always going to be m. So what do you guys think 11 is? It, it's a? Dang it. It's a derivative of 1. So remember, if you're doing the antiderivative f little prime, right? It is double. So we do the antiderivative f little prime comes f prime. And you should try acting f prime b with f prime a. So here's the deal. If that's a linear function, the first derivative is just going to be a constant, right? So oh, f, yeah. f prime b is a constant. f prime a is also a constant. They're identical constants because they come from the same line. A constant minus itself is going to be zero. Yeah. So if and it's linear, your second derivative is going to be zero anyway. And your anti driving zero. And then 12 is continuity. 12 is a continuity situation. In order for the limit to exist, you gotta be continuous. Actually, no, you don't have to, sorry, to be continuous, you have to, the limit has to exist. I, I lied, I got reversed, but still. But if you're not continuous, you don't have a limit. Actually, well, yeah, it's E. The left-hand limit. <laughs> Is natural log of two, right? The right hand limit is four natural log two. Those are not the same. The limit does not exist. Totally different. Yep. Yep. In order for the in order for the limit to exist, the left right hand limit have to meet up. Yeah. There could, there, could, there could be a hole there. Um, you didn't have to do the derivative after that. Then you have to do the derivative, and but not, you're not being asked about differentiability, so don't worry about that. Oh, it just has to be the same point. Right. Right. Okay, let's keep moving. Oh, let me back up. 12 z. Again, uh, the left hand limit must equal the right hand limit for the limit to exist at a particular point. In the left hand limit, all you do is just plug in zero, plug in whatever x is approaching for the one where x is less than two, and then the one for x greater than two, plug in that, and they have to um, link up to be a, for the limit to exist. Wait, so we're plugging in what for both? Two. Okay. Yep. But they're not the same when you do that. Um, Let's jump to 17. I'll probably have you guys do 13 through 16 right before class is over. But let's jump to 17. Let's do some um, more conceptual ones. Okay. So they're actually going to compare f of one, f prime one, and f of prime one. This actually should be pretty fast. Obviously, what's f of one? Zero. 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 Now, f prime one, I don't know what it is exactly, but it's f prime one. That's a slope of tangent. Is that positive or negative? Positive. Positive, good. And this graph, does that look like it's concave down or concave up? No, no. Which means the second derivative is? Negative. So therefore, f little prime is negative, f prime is positive, f1 is zero. D. It's going to be D. Yes, exactly. Exactly, it's going to be D. Like that's a gimme. Because that's f prime one. So that's f prime, which is positive. You're concave down. So that's negative and that's zero. And you gotta just put in the right order. So that's why it's D. Yes, good, okay. Okay, let's say on these four here. Um, okay, if you want the equation of tangent line, you do need to find Y prime. That's gonna be your slope. Remember, in equations, y equals mx plus b. And remember, your slope okay, so you got to figure that out. This one here, remember, 
We actually did this not, not that long ago. F dollar prime has to change sign. Remember I said they could give you something kind of tricky. Actually, I didn't even know they're gonna ask this. I'm, I'm not talking about 19. I, I'm giving you guys some hints. I'm not solving this just yet. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm giving you guys hints for 18, 19, 20. And then for 20, um, you might want to consider it graphically. Zero. <laughs> Ah, messy handwriting. You're good, Mister. We know what you're writing. You're all good. Oh, thanks. I need you to erase the board here. You know, unfortunately, I do have COVID, so I cannot yeah, I help you with that. <laughs> I, I know um, that. <laughs> like, I would love to be there. I yeah. promise you, I would. But unfortunately, I am You'll not. Get better. Oh Books of health first, right? No, I feel fine. I just have positive tests. I know. I'm irritated about it. All right. We talked about right right before you got here. That was number one. Okay, so I'll give you guys hints for both eight for uh, not both, but among 18, 19, 20, 21. So 18, you gotta take the derivative of that, plug in zero, get your slope, then um, plug in zero, and your is one, obviously. Um, actually, that makes it pretty easy. Now it's easy to get A or B now. Um, and then 19, you gotta see where the second derivative changes. So they already give the second derivative, so you just see where it changes signs. So sign. You can do a sign chart mentally too if you want. 20, just think graphically because you want the area to be zero. So that's area. And so that's why equals x squared, negative three is up here. So try to think graphically there. 21, in case you guys forgot, you don't have to um, do the separable differential equation bit. Whenever these are in this location, that's gonna, you can assume that solution. That's a law of exponential change. So that should be able to help a little bit with what uh, we expect the answer to be. Do you guys get B for 18? No. Never mind. Maybe, maybe I made a mistake. I don't know. <laughs> what's y prime going to be? I don't know. I don't think uh, that's the f y. 18, what's the derivative of x plus cos x? Um, one. Minus. Okay, now plug in zero for x. One minus zero. Which is one. What's that? One no, derivative of cosine is negative sine. Uh, right, derivative of cosine. Uh, slope's one. Your slope's one. And your y slope's one also. But you already give it to you. They give you zero comma one. That's why I'm stuck. Okay, that's fine. You could. And then 19. Where does secondary change sign? Yep, good. Okay, hold on. 18 or are we okay with 18? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so it doesn't change sign at two because you have x minus two squared. Oh, it bounces. It bounces, yes. You only see a sign check negative one and zero. What about, what about 20? Okay, I'll stop. I'll, I'll, I'm sorry, I'm probably doing everything wrong at this point. Wait a minute. If you do a sign chart for the second derivative, I'll do it right here. Oh, it'll be positive. Yeah, so it's just a sign change there. It's just a sign change. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yes, please come in. Let me show the problem. This is just crash box. Yeah, once you guys work on 2021, well, let me figure out. Yeah, so here's the situation. Uh, usually when I connect to the project, thank you. Uh, um, I use the Epson projector. Okay. I'll, I'll show you right now why it's not working. So, uh, yeah, so I do this. Okay. Gotcha. And then um, let me uh, disconnect yeah. here. Yeah. Did you mind I move the ladder in here? I think you move the cable there. Oh, sure. Yeah, of course. No problem. Yeah. So take time. Yeah, so then when I do that, um, hold on, let's show you. Yeah, so I'll, I'll do this first. That's what I always do. I know it's old school. school. All right. And I type in um, this code, uh -huh. it won't connect. Yeah, that's right. It's kind of different. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. okay. So you need to do it. Okay. Yeah. okay. Got it. Got it. Okay, we're going to go a little low tech, guys, because yeah. some, someone's working on the projector. Okay. Um, hopefully, you guys got A for number 20. Yeah. Okay. Whenever the lower and upper limits are the same, you have zero for the integral, oh, right? Yeah. Okay. And given that y equals x squared is always oh. above the x axis, you're never going to have any region below. So there's never going to be any uh, regions that cancel out. So it's only at negative three. And then for 21, for 21, whenever you have this situation here, dy over dt equals ky, you can assume the solution. So you got to pick something that looks like that. The only thing that looks like that, it's going to be, um, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll come out that. Sorry. Okay, got it. What do you got? What do you get for 21? I got B. B, yes. Yes. <laughs> Good. Okay. While we're uh, taking care of the tech situation, um, let's go back to 13 through 16. Let's get 13 through 16 a shot. Wait, why is it B for 21? Because you're assuming this solution right here. Whenever this happens, you can see this. And why do we assume the solution? That's remember the whole, like we, uh, we separate, then we integrate, yeah. isolate, like the, the substitute. If you were to, to go through the process of several differential equations, you would get this. And these looks like closest to that. Okay, if you guys can do 13 through 16, please. Yeah. And I'll um, go through it also. It's <laughs> not. Not it. <laughs> yeah, 30 is a good review for first semester. Mm -hmm, okay. it, yeah, they say so. <laughs> it's right there. <laughs> they say so. <laughs> Yeah, let's try right now. Yes. Let's see here. Okay. So if I do manual search, so one oh point oh two point oh oh point two two seven. Found it. And then see here. And then let's do this. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. So, so what was the problem? Oh, yeah, during the break, we upgraded our Apple TV. We uh, okay. It's for Apple people. Uh, you realize you're going to see the TV. That's why. Switch the Apple TV back. So can... Sure, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll see if that. Yeah, it looks like it's working. Yeah. So, here you go. Let's see. Come on, that. So, anyone can use it. All right, and then go ahead and switch them back for your laptop. And I should be on set. Yeah. Yep. yep. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. All right, now I feel like.
right. Okay, I'm gonna switch my other device. Hold on a sec. Okay.